Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Melfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars, some of my favourite people, and people who have changed the world with their journalism, with their books, and with their honesty. A man who I've been fascinated by for many years is called Andrew Morton. He's got a brand new book out called 17 Carnations, The Royals, the Nazis, and the Biggest Cover-Up in History. That's quite a title, Andrew. Congratulations. You've got me curious. <laughs> Thank you, yes. It's, it's a title that kind of emerged out of the copy because I did realise that when um, I looked at the, the evidence that, yes, indeed, there, there was a file on the Duke and Duchess of Windsor uh, on their relationship with the Nazi Party, which not only Winston Churchill, but Dwight Eisenhower, the President of America. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's been an ongoing gag for years about the royal family and the Nazis, but what you've done have been the first person to really research this and almost prove it. I mean, it's worrying in one way, fascinating at the very least. Um, Why did you decide to spend so much time on this? Because it's been three years of your life, hasn't it? Yes, it has been three years. Um, I... I was intrigued about, about this story a few years ago. I, I read just a little snippet in a book about a metal canister that had been dug up from a, a German estate, and inside the canister was microfilm, microfilm relating to the German Foreign Office. And this was manna from heaven for the Allies, because it was all about um, uh, Ribbentrop, the uh, German Foreign Minister, Molotov, the Russian Foreign Minister, Franco, and Mussolini, uh, and all these characters. And so, and so the Allies saw this as a heaven-sent opportunity to prove to the world that the Nazis and the Axis powers had actually started the war, planned the war, and that the sacrifice had not been in vain. And yet, when they opened the file and dug a bit further, they discovered these documents relating to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Mm. And they were absolutely shocked by it, because it, it showed that... Um, Certainly, according to the German ambassadors to Lisbon and to Madrid, the Duke and Duchess had been in cahoots with the Nazis. He he talked openly about going, if he'd been on the throne, the war had never happened. He talked openly about uh, bombing uh, British cities to bring England into subjugation. But, But also, he'd made sly and secret contact with the Nazis at a time when they were trying to And this was a, uh, an operation called Operation Willie. And yet, the, the Duke, unbeknownst to the Duke, he was in contact with the Nazis anyway about looking after his uh, homes in Paris and in the south of France. And more than that, uh, he, was, he asked them to look after his possessions, especially their fine linen. Now, here was a man who, just a few, a few years before, had been the, the head of Britain, of you know, the apex of British society as, as king, but also he, he was extremely disloyal to his his brother, not just to to his country. He was, uh, the King George VI. He was so he was saying that he was very stupid. That the Queen, the, later the Queen Mother, was, was conniving. So he was extremely disloyal. And if this information had come out at the time in 1945, he would have put a bomb under Buckingham Palace. Hmm. Where do they go from here? Do they just ignore it? Do they acknowledge it? Do they deny it? Do they try and defend it? Where do they go? Well, the, King George VI did acknowledge it. He was very concerned about it. And uh, remember, he'd fallen out with his brother over the abdication. Hmm. Uh, and his brother didn't have any uh, any, any uh, kind of status in, in Britain. He was, he was effectively exiled. But at the same time, he was very concerned about the possible damage to the monarchy. And... The, and and so was Churchill, and and so were the, uh, many other British politicians who knew about this. And and there was a concerted campaign to destroy this file. And um, a, 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 but it was the Americans who said, "Well, hang on, this is history. This is a bit of history, and you've got to publish it at some point." And they spent twelve years trying to kick it into the long grass, as it were. And it was only after twelve years that it was published. Now, so. It was published in 1957, but at the time, it was hedged around with all kinds of caveats. There was a new reign. Queen Elizabeth II was on the throne, um, our present queen. 
uh, the, the Duke of Windsor by then was a far more marginal figure, mm. and he was just seen as a playboy prince, flitting from Palm Beach to Paris to the south of France. So, and also, it was couched in terms that he was the victim of Nazi machinations, that he was the victim of the Nazi plot. Well, not so much. He was uh, quite active in considering their offer. They'd offered him a castle in the south of uh, Spain, but offered him 50 million um, Swiss francs. Uh, so they'd even send their chief spy master, a man called Walter Schellenberg, out of Lisbon to kidnap him and his wife, Wallace Simpson, and bring them to Spain where they would await uh, the moment when they could be uh, made the, the new king and queen of England. How has this been received in 2015 by the royal household and Buckingham Palace? Have they reacted yet? They've not reacted yet, but I, th- I think that they will They will see that this is, this is something that's been touched on um, over the years by various people, but never analysed properly. Right. And this is what I've done, this is why I've spent years on this, going through all the documents which relate to it. And it, and it does paint not a particularly edifying picture, quite frankly, of the mm. British establishment, because they, they prevaricated, they tried to destroy the fire, they, then they tried to uh, delay the publication. And at the same time, George VI was sending his courtiers around Europe to pick up correspondence from Queen Victoria and from others, and obviously at the time saying to his courtiers, well, if you see anything about the Duke of Windsor, keep a weather eye out, because uh, we need to keep that, in, uh, we need to bring that back to London for safekeeping. Do you know what's amazing about your story? It's almost like exactly the same thing as going on with the government right now and the paedophile rings and the BBC and Savile cover-up. I mean, this is the same sort of thing, isn't it? Where these people think they're bigger than the truth, they're bigger than society and can cover it up. Eventually you get caught out. It seems unthinkable that at some point someone like you wouldn't discover this truth. Well, that's a very good point. I mean, this episode shows that Instinctively, the British establishment is deferential towards the monarchy. Instinctively, the British establishment uh, goes for the blue pen to censor, censor, censor. Whereas, generally speaking, the Americans tend to go towards disclosure. Mm. In this case, there was a, a degree of collusion between both sides. And it was only the activities of a couple of feisty American academics that stopped these these papers from being destroyed. And you're absolutely right. There, there has been a culture of secrecy in Britain that has led to what's gone on at the BBC, certainly what's gone on with Savile, and this kind of cosy old boys network uh, worked very effectively at this, uh, in, at this time that I'm describing, because what what, did, what happened at the palace when they get to, got to hear about it? Well, they went to MI5 and MI6 and asked them what they thought. Mm. So. Uh, you know, they went down to their clubs on Pall Mall and had a little quiet chat. It's extraordinary. The new book is out now. It's called 17 Carnations, The Royals, the Nazis and the Biggest Cover-Up in History. When you read it, it's like fiction, but of course it's reality. And that's what's extraordinary about this story. It's the old saying, isn't it? You couldn't make this stuff up. No, you can't make it. And, and uh, what really intrigued me first of all was this extraordinary discovery in the first place, how this uh, Scottish librarian who worked at the Foreign Office, um, an extraordinary ch- chap called uh, Robert Curry Thompson, um, worked part-time as a, as a missionary during the uh, interwar years and also as a king's messenger delivering packages around Europe, built up a, a network of people that he knew. And it he, he just so happened he met uh, a, a, the Hitler's uh, second-in-command as a translator who had actually disobeyed orders from the Nazi high command because they said destroy all the documents mm. you know, because obviously in the dying days of the Second World War they, had to, they were trying to cover up their tracks and these archivists to their great car- uh, credit and courage because the SS were, were ordered to uh, force them to destroy these documents they'd hidden them and this guy had actually make a, made a microfilm of the, of the most secret documents and hidden it in this tin. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, this is the great, a great opening for a film. 
Incredible. And I'm sure it will be at some point because it, it is almost unbelievable in places what you revealed. The final question on this is, were there points where you wondered whether this book would ever get published because you either A, couldn't prove or stand up what you'd found or people tried to get in the way of the publication? My primary publisher is American. Where the, and in America, there's freedom of expression. Mm. In Britain, uh, not so much. We have draconian laws that stop you from doing all kinds of things. Um, fortunately, in terms of the law, most of the people involved in this whole saga are dead, so yeah. you can't uh, legally libel the dead. Um, it was it was more a question of of justifying the title because it was a massive cover up, and I was astonished myself because. Initially, I was also looking at the work of Anthony Blunt. Now, Anthony Blunt was a Soviet spy uh, and a member of, what, of what's known as the Cambridge Spy Ring. He was also a king's, uh, the surveyor of the king's pictures. He worked for George VI, and he was sent on a, an extraordinary mission himself to a castle in Germany to pick up these letters uh, from Queen Victoria. And this is this has been a, a little escapade that has always been surrounded in intrigue because many people have suspected that Blunt and the, his colleague, a man called Moorshead, were uh, sent there by George VI to pick up incriminating letters that the Duke of Windsor had sent to Hitler uh, mm. during the Second World War. Or he had sent those le letters to the man who owned the castle, a guy called Prince Philip, not the, not the uh, husband of our present Queen. And so that little episode is one which has uh, been the one that's made the headlines. But it's ironically, it's the other one, which I've dis uh, earlier described, about discovering this microfilm in a tin hidden in a, in a forest that is a more extraordinary story. Well, you've done it again, Andrew. Another book that's got people talking and thinking. That's what you do. The Royals, the Nazis, and the biggest cover-up in history is available now with Michael Amara Books. It's available on Amazon and other places. I want to talk about you, if we can, because there you are, a Jewsbury boy, just being a journo at the Mail and other places, doing what you do. And then you go to become one of the most prolific, one of the most respected, one of the most controversial writers in history. It's an amazing trajectory that you had. And the people that you've written about probably most famously Diana did you ever think you'd become this or did you think you'd just be one of those typewriter journos that's writing stories day in and day out for the newspapers well I I, I started off in in journalism um, I worked for what's called the mirror group train scheme down in the west country and then I, I worked as a, both a sub editor and a, and a reporter in Manchester and in London and I was asked to become the royal correspondent of, a, of the newspaper I was working for. And I knew nothing about the royal family. Um, I knew that you, you spent the spelling of Prince Philip, and that was about it. <laughs> and um, I found myself, within a matter of weeks, on a plane to the island of Mustique in the Caribbean, chasing Prince Andrew and a girl called Ku Stark, who was at the time billed as a soft porn actress. Mm. They'd gone under the, uh, under the married name of Mr. and Mrs. Cambridge, He'd just come back from the Falklands, of the, of the hero of the Falklands War. Everybody thought they got, they'd got married, and it was hysteria. And I realised that this was the, the most fun you could have with your clothes on. And I, and, but at the same time, I wrote my first book then, um, Andrew the Playboy Prince, mm. uh, which was described by one newspaper as the worst book ever written. We'll, we'll let that one pass. But, I, then, but, I, that, but writing that book anyway gave me an appetite for actually writing longer form uh, works and I started writing royal books I wrote the first story about uh, the, uh, Sarah Ferguson her romance with Prince Andrew and then subsequently wrote her biography wrote various other royal books and, and got quite familiar with the royal scene and started to build up a lot of contacts and, I, and, and then in the mid 1980s I went freelance and started working for myself it's certainly been an interesting year for Prince Andrew. Where does this leave him and his legacy in terms of the royal family and his position promoting the United Kingdom? Well, certainly Prince Andrew has had a, uh, an awful lot of bad publicity. Certainly his, his relationships with some pretty unsavoury politicians. Um, uh, and also uh, the, uh, an unsavoury American who's uh, in the sex scandal surrounding him. Um, I've, I've no plans to write any books about them, but they're certainly worth a, a, a profile at the moment because 
what's going on is, is fascinating. Do you think there are still shenanigans with the royal family? Have they learnt their lessons that you just can't get away with anything now, with social media, with email, with everything in a paper trail? You're so less likely to get away with it than you were before. you think they'd learn, wouldn't you? I think, actually, they get away with an awful lot, quite frankly. Um, I think that it's something of a, a shimmer, I think, that just because you've got Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, that gives you access to the in the most uh, thoughts and reaches of, of uh, Buckingham Palace. Mm. In actual fact, I would argue that the royal family is more secretive today than it was before because um, William and Harry uh, and Kate uh, have a pretty tight ship. William uh, is very concerned about his, uh, any publicity about him and his wife. And, uh, and unlike previous generations, he will resort to the law to uh, gag newspapers. So I would actually, I would actually argue that unless they do something absolutely ridiculous that comes out in, in you know, uh, they they largely get away with things and, mm. and you, they live live a, a relatively private life away from from the uh, royal engagements that they undertake. I guess they are literally a law unto themselves, and that's what your new book is about. In terms of your body of work, which is the book you're most proud of? I mean, you've had some extraordinary successes. Obviously, we think of Tom Cruise and the Monica book, and Diana has to be your most famous. Which are you most proud of in terms of the legacy it will leave in history? Well, when I die and somebody writes my obituary, the first sentence will be Princess Diana's biographer. So, so obviously, that's a book that stands head and shoulders above anything else I've ever written and will ever write because it was an extraordinary, unique book mm. that, but with the co- active collaboration and cooperation of the subject, discussing things which had never been dealt with before. And you, you talked about, you know, could, could the royal family get away with it? Well, they had been getting away with it for years because everybody, until my book came out, believed in the fairy tale of Charles and Diana. In fact, mm. um, that's the world believed in and I was like the character out of a Hans Christian Andersen <laughs> story saying well the emperor's got no clothes mm. so so to, to that extent that book is by far and away the, the book that I'm, I'm proudest of because the actual mechanism of doing it was very complicated and um, needed a lot of thought from what we've discussed in the last 20 minutes, it sounds perfectly feasible that in 20 years you could write another book about a current royal that appears to be happy that possibly isn't. I mean, is it still that much smoke and mirrors in the royal family that that is possible? Well, let's just, let's just look at uh, Catherine Middleton for a moment. She seems a, a, a very decent, pleasant girl, but she's been put into this extraordinary position as, as the future queen, mm. as a commoner, uh, parents, decent uh, middle-class people from you know from, from the from the Green Acres of Berkshire, um, they they uh, yeah. What do we really know about the inner workings of her heart, her head, uh, the calculations that she's had to undertake, going from St Andrews University to mm. uh, the place that she occupies now what role of her mother, Carol, her father, uh, what what discussions have ta- taken place behind behind closed doors, what rows and so on. There's a, I'm sure there's, there's, an awful, there's, there's an awful lot there that we know nothing about because they've all remained extremely tight-lipped. Your description sounds reminiscent of a, a young Diana, doesn't it? Well, of course, well ex- exactly. <laughs> because she's gone, she's gone through the same trajectory. Mm. Um, because, and that's what makes people interesting. What's the trajectory of her life yeah. from being an obscure um, middle-class girl that, that you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't look twice at in the street, apart from the fact that she's quite a pretty girl, um, to some to someone who is now seen as a savior of the royal family, um, a pin-up, um, an international uh, uh, character, someone uh, uh, so. What does it do to her yeah. as a person? And, and she's, got, you know, she's undergone two very difficult pregnancies, as we as we all know. Um, and there's, there's all the, the, the pressures of that and the pressures to perform. Um, well, how has she, you know, um, coped with it all? 
It's a fascinating life you've had. I always, when I read your books, wonder what you didn't put in. I think that could be a book in itself, how much doesn't get through the lawyers. Your mind must be fascinating. You could start a conference, couldn't you really, Andrew? Yeah, I could start a conference. (laughs) (laughs) I think the last person I asked this question to was Piers Morgan. But did you ever have a moment of fear when you worried you'd gone too far with any of your books or anything you'd written within those books? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, With the the Diana book, it was terrifying because you knew that you were going to be cut to pieces Mm. um, by the establishment. And you knew that everything had to be accurate. And you knew that everybody who had spoken to me had to stand by what they'd said because it had to be absolutely watertight. Otherwise, you'd, you'd be sunk, literally. Did you ever fear that the establishment or somebody bigger than yourself could wipe you out just to shut you up? Well, there was, yes, there was always that fear. I mean, uh, the, during the, the research for the book, my office was broke. Uh, I was warned by uh, a couple of journalists that you know Buckingham Palace were on my trail and that the police had been called in to find out who were my contacts. And then a few weeks later, my office was broken into and all the files gone through, camera stolen. Um, who did it? No clue. But, you know, mm. it was an interesting uh, confluence of events. In fact, funny enough, when I did a book on Tom Cruise, some guy in Los Angeles said to me, do you want a piece? I said, a piece of what? He said, a piece. I said, what do you mean? He said, a gun. I said, no, to look wow. after yourself. Scientologists <laughs> come after you. How very American. What's next? Where do you go from now? We've had the Nazis, the Raws, we've had Tom Cruise, we've had Diana. Who's next? Well, I'm actually... I've uncovered some quite interesting material about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, which um, I'll, I'm going to explore over the next few months because it's led me down a track which is which could actually um, reveal a lot more about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor than perhaps is known at the moment. Well, we look forward to reading it. Andrew Morton, thank you so much for your time. Your new book's available now on Amazon around the world. It's certainly uh, doing well, and the Americans just love it. They're all over it, aren't they? Yeah, the Americans are, and the Canadians, actually, yeah. Mm. So um, um, it's, it's something which has kind of touched a nerve. Really great to talk to you, Andrew Morton. Thanks for your time. My pleasure.